everyone, my name is Ayla Tesler Mabe, and today I'm going to be showing you the six levels of soloing on the guitar. And of course, this is just my opinion. I just wanted to share my approach with you to hopefully give you some ideas around how to take things to the next level. And learning how to play the guitar and especially solo and improvise on the guitar is a lifelong journey. So a lot of guitar driven music comes from blues music. And I wanted to center this lesson sort of around blues. And the reason for that is because if you can get through a 12 bar blues chord progression and really understand how to add a lot of color and nice tasty stuff to your playing in this context, you can definitely apply it to a lot of other contexts as well. And so the first thing I wanted to show you is how to find the safe notes to get through a chord progression because that's the first step. And so level one of soloing on the electric guitar comes down to the pentatonic scale. In this particular lesson, we're gonna be centering things around a 12 bar blues in the key of A. And blues is a really special type of music in its standard form, in the sense that it's kind of sitting between major and minor sounds. It kind of breaks the rules in that way. So it gives you the opportunity to play both major and minor pentatonic sounds in your playing. Essentially, the clue that this is the case is the fact that this whole chord progression is over dominant chords. And because of that, we can use the minor pentatonic shape starting from the root note. We're in A. Here's A at the fifth fret. Let's build our minor pentatonic scale from this note. Five, eight, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, eight, five, eight. And so that's the most basic form of the minor pentatonic scale. And if you play that scale anywhere else on the neck, because there are many different positions you can play it in, you're still just playing the same notes, essentially. Now the next step is realizing that if you take that shape, you move it down three frets, you're going to be playing major pentatonic. And literally the exact same scale shape. In this case, we're playing two, five, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, five, two, five. And so, if I'm playing over a backing track, any of the notes from that minor pentatonic scale are gonna give me that bluesy minor pentatonic sound. All of those notes are safe. And now if I wanted a major version of that, just move down three frets, I can literally play the exact same thing. I can go back and forth between them. That's such a good scale to work on as a guitar player. You will get so much mileage out of it. If you're playing in A minor or in a minor key, use your minor pentatonic shape. All of those notes will be safe for you to choose from. Then let's say we're playing in A major. Over this kind of chord progression, for example, use your major pentatonic. And then if we're playing a blues in A and it's, you know, over dominant chords, these sorts of bluesy chords, you have the opportunity to use major and minor. All right, so now that we have our foundation set, let's move on to level two, which is building a lick vocabulary. The reason I think this is so important, especially if you're just starting uh, to learn how to improvise and create your own sort of melodies on the guitar is a lot of people find that when they're first getting familiar with the pentatonic shapes and they're starting to get that internalized and under their fingertips, they find that it sounds like they're just playing a scale and it doesn't sound like a real musical expressive phrase. 
And I've been there. That was a huge struggle that I came across when I was you know, first starting on my guitar journey. Uh, and something that helped remedy this was to build a vocabulary of licks that I found online from other players, listening to my favorite music, wherever it was, that I could use as a foundation in my solos. So I could take these licks and I could string them all together and sound like I was playing something really musical. Uh, and then over time, the idea is these licks really just give you inspiration to come up with your own ideas. And then you'll be able to find your own sound. So an example would be, and I've brought this up in past videos before, so if you've ever seen any of my other videos on soloing, maybe you've heard me ramble on about this before, uh, but Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix has that iconic opening lick that I just transposed down to the key of A, because Jimi Hendrix, a lot of his playing is in minor pentatonic and major pentatonic, so it makes it easier to apply that to any other key as long as you find where it sits in the pentatonic shape. But here's the lick. And that's all coming from the minor pentatonic scale. And the beauty is if I really learn this lick, I will be able to use it in my soloing. So just to go over how to play it, you hear at the eighth fret of the B string, you do a whole step bend, then you play five on the E string, eight five on the B string. And then this is a great bluesy type of phrase to learn how to play. And it's just me bending on the G string here, and then pulling off to the fifth fret, landing on the seventh fret of the D string, and then you end that lick on the fifth fret of the G string. And once you get this down, if you move it down three frets, it will totally work as a major pentatonic lick as well. And it's not always the case that you can take any lick from minor and move it to major and vice versa, but it's very often that you can, especially if it's just sitting in the pentatonic shape. And so anytime you learn a lick, try it out and see if it works. Uh, if you learn it in major, try it in minor. If you learned it in minor, try it in major. All right, so you don't have to only take licks from the pentatonic scale. Sometimes finding a lick that's sort of centered generally in that scale but falls outside of it totally works too. And that can be a great way to start adding sophisticated sounds into your playing without necessarily knowing what you're doing. Because the first step is just making the music and then the understanding can come later if you want it to. But an example of this would be, you know, in the song Black Magic Woman, uh, Santana's version of, of course, the Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green original, it ends with this really wonderful lick. Which again, I can move down to major pentatonic. I think it sounds nice. But the main reason I want to bring this up is when I first started playing, I didn't understand why I could play because I realized that this note here didn't belong in the minor pentatonic scale, but I knew it sounded good. But the understanding came later, and that brings us to level three. So level three is learning what kind of notes you can add to the pentatonic shape to add more color to your playing. And so, to give you an example, that note that I just played in that Black Magic Woman lick is actually a note coming from the blues scale. And it just so happens that anytime you play minor pentatonic, you can use that note. And essentially, what happens is the pentatonic scale becomes this. That was the blue note. There it is again. And of course that extension still works. And if you move this down three frets, it actually ends up working in that major pentatonic zone as well, though it is coming from a different place and maybe that's another topic for another video. But long story short, you can add that note to the shape in major or minor 
But in the case of minor, it turns into the blues scale. And we've been talking a lot about blues, so it kind of makes sense that you know, the blues scale would work in this context. And it can turn your scale into something like this. So it gives you another note to target when you're improvising. Now another example is a mode called Dorian. And that might sound scary because everyone is told to fear modes. The thing is, you don't have to fear them at all because all you have to do to turn minor pentatonic, a nice friendly scale we all love, into a mode is just add two notes. So instead of playing this, we can play like that. There's the Dorian note we're adding, the second. And then this note, the sixth. And I'm just referring to the intervals or the colors of those notes. If you don't know what that means, I'm sure I'll do a video on that in the future. It's worth looking into. But yeah, what happens is minor pentatonic becomes Dorian if you add those two notes. And then continue up the scale. And now, even without fully playing Dorian, if you just target one of those notes we added, something like this, which is a nice pentatonic lick, can become something like this. And so I kind of played around with the same notes there, but I added that color and suddenly it sounded so much more sophisticated. So imagine you're playing a blues. And that's an example of how those two notes can add so much. And so I know I've thrown a couple theory terms your way. I think the most important takeaway is trust your ear and try exploring notes outside of the pentatonic scale. And if you find that they sound good, then they are good. That's, that's the end of the story. But of course, feel free to try out the scales that are in the diagrams in this video. Try them out, see what you think. Just try adding even one of those notes and see what happens. But long story short, explore and trust your ear. So I've been giving you some scales that work throughout the entirety of a chord progression because sometimes it's nice to just center yourself in, okay, I'm in A, I'm gonna choose one scale that sounds good throughout the whole progression and just riff on that for a while because I don't wanna be thinking, I wanna be trying to explore with my ear and be playing with emotion and that's great. But for number four, this is level four. But number four is following the changes. Because in a 12 bar blues, you start with your one chord, A dominant in this case, and you're on this chord for a while. And then you go to the four chord, which is D7. And then back to A7. Then we go to our five chord, E7. Then back to D7. And then back to A7. And then end with E7. And that's a really typical 12 bar blues form that you'll definitely encounter. Like I said, choosing one scale to work over all of those chords. I am going to show you how you can find the arpeggios of our four chord and five chord. So then you can end up with something like this. Just pentatonic. See there, I outlined that chord. And then when it gets to the five chord, you can do the same thing. So then, you're gonna be able to start hearing those changes go by without them even being there because you're outlining all of the chord tones in your playing. Chord tones meaning the tones belonging to the chord that you're playing over. And so there's this really handy dominant seven uh, arpeggio shape I'm gonna show you that you can apply to any dominant chord, but it'll work especially well for this blues situation we're in here. And so here we are playing over D7, our four chord, Here's the arpeggio shape. Fifth fret A string, four, seven on the D string, 
And then five, seven on the G string. Seventh fret B string. And then five, eight on the high E string. I played it wrong there. Hold on. <laughs> there you go. I stepped a little outside of the arpeggio. And did you notice that that note actually sounded fine? There's an example of a happy little accident. This shape, if you want to play over our E7 chord, E7 is two frets above D7, so it would be logical to conclude that we can take that dominant seven arpeggio, shift it up two frets. And again, I added that other note to show that it works any key you're in over any chord in that arpeggio shape. It works to add that extra special accident note. Very cool, right? All right, level five. Things can start to get a little jazzy in this next step we're gonna take. And of course, if you don't like jazz music and you actually hate it. You're not stupid. Jazz is stupid. I mean, just play the right notes. I know. At least understanding where these approaches come from can be really helpful because you actually see it used in lots of other styles as well. But essentially, we've been looking at how do we find all the right notes to play over a chord progression? You know, all the safe notes and all the notes that accentuate the chord changes. But sometimes people are thinking about all the safe notes, but then they link all the safe notes together with a bunch of kind of weird notes. But the reason you might want to do that is to build tension, because there's so much emotion you can create in music when you build tension and then find a way to release it. Like, for example, this arpeggio shape. You see these notes on the high E string? I link them together with all of the notes in between, because chromatic just means moving by a semitone, or in other words, moving by a fret, up or down, because that's how the guitar is laid out. But what can happen is, let's say you choose your target notes. Let's choose these notes. Part of that D7 arpeggio. This is our one, three, five. There are a few little tricks you can use to get you started in this world of chromaticism. So the first uh, that we looked at a second ago is just seeing two notes on the same string and just filling in all the space in between. There's an example. Here's another approach. Uh, you can do the two fret above approach, where essentially these are our target notes. We're going to approach all of them from two frets above and walk down chromatically. Sounds kind of jazzy. We can do the same thing from two frets below. Also pretty cool. And the next approach is the over, under, target note approach. Again, here's our target note. We start from a fret above, over, fret below, under, target. And then now do the same thing in the inverse. Under, over, target. And there's really no exceptions to this rule. Uh, as long as you are landing on the right target note, you've found a way to resolve this tension you're creating. And by using any of those tricks I just spoke about, you'll be creating a lot of cool tension. So to give you an example, say we're playing a blues. So that's something to try out, and I hope you have fun exploring that. Okay, so we've arrived at level six. And here's the thing. I wanted to start with this level just because I, I really think that overall this is the most important part of soloing. But at the same time, I wanted to put it at the end because I wanted to really hit home the fact that 
you know, figuring out how to come up with interesting and suave phrases in your playing and hitting all the right notes and sounding sophisticated and all that is cool. And it's definitely a part of the puzzle, right? Because finding the right colors in your playing can be a huge part of what makes your playing, you know, evocative and expressive. Ultimately, that's only a fraction of the puzzle when you, can cons when you consider how important it is to play with finesse and feeling and soul. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that most of the greatest players of all time had one thing in common, really, and that was the amount of finesse and feeling in their playing. And I don't think it's a coincidence either that it's really common to encounter players who've been playing for a long time, who are really seasoned, who leave a lot of space in their playing. It's almost like the more wise and experienced someone becomes, the more they appreciate space. And as Claude Debussy and later Miles Davis said, music is the space between the notes. And that's what can separate you know, a guitar player from a musician. And what I mean by that is when you're a guitar player, you can be technically incredible and you know how to fly up and down the neck and do crazy stuff. But a musician is someone who's expressing music through their instrument, right? It's almost like it's expressing the human experience on another level, where it feels like someone's almost speaking through their instrument. And it's really interesting. Sometimes people will do little tricks like hold their breath while they're playing, and then when they run out of breath, the phrase stops. Because that helps you sometimes turn your guitar playing into something a little bit closer to storytelling the way a person would when they're speaking with their voice. I also wanted to talk about a few techniques that really help in making the guitar as expressive as possible, such as bending, sliding, and vibrato. Again, if you've seen my videos in the past, I've definitely talked about this a lot. You know, the difference between a phrase like this and can sometimes be the difference between you know, a solo that's good and really cool and a solo that's beautiful and soulful. Again, it's up to you to decide how you want to approach soloing. I'm not saying this is really the objective end of your guitar playing journey or that I've discovered any secrets here, but I'm just pointing out the fact that you know, making the guitar expressive uh, can be a really wonderful thing. And that's definitely something that a lot of my favorite players have had in common. So again, I'm trying to think about if you're playing a note or a phrase, can you add a slide between some of the notes? Can you add a bend? And uh, can you work on your vibrato? Because that can be a huge part of developing your own individual sound and fingerprint on the instrument because everyone has a different vibrato and it's so cool to discover how you express yourself on the instrument. And again, all of these techniques are a huge part of that. So that was Ayla's personal approach to soloing in six levels. And even if you disagreed with everything I said, I hope that this showed you, you know, some examples of where your playing could go or you hated everything that I said so much, it solidified your own ideas contrary to what I said. And I think that's the best part of having any discussion. So I hope that this you know, gave you some ideas around where to go next in your guitar playing. And leave a comment down below of what tip has helped you the most for soloing. And please have a wonderful day. <laughs>